and welcome to part two of the lecture on Jekyll and Hyde in the city. So the first lecture, um, what we looked at was the move to the city in urban Gothic. And this lecture is going to look at the figure of the Flaneur, um, as well as kind of urban exploration in the city. So my name is Sophie Wayne, and I'm a PhD student in the Department of English Literature and Creative Writing at Lancaster University. And my research looks at Penny Dreadful's Gothic and the city. Um, so this workshop, what we're going to be doing is I will give you my interpretations of the text in relation to this topic, but there'll also be opportunities for you to pause the recording and complete some activities um, and think about some of the questions that I've posed. Okay, so just to make a start, and um, this is just a brief uh, summary. So what we're going to do is first I'm going to discuss what the Flamua is um, and why the, this was such a prominent figure in the 19th century. Um, then what we're going to talk about um, in relation to Jekyll and Hyde is the walking for leisure, the flaneur as a detective, and the aggressive or criminal flaneur. Okay. So the flaneur is a French term, uh, which means stroller or loafer, and this was quite a prominent figure in the 19th century. Um, this idea was, the term was coined by um, poet Charles Baudelaire. So the Flaneur was generally a wealthy gentleman who would wander around the city and observe its citizens. I've listed here some of the key characteristics of the Flaneur. And so Walter Benjamin, who's probably the most influential writer on Charles Baudelaire and the Flaneur, argued that this figure was a hybrid between an investigator and a journalist. So the Flaneur is an impartial observer of the city and its citizens. Um, so the Flaneur enabled to kind of remain on the fringes of society and of the people that he observes um, would need to be kind of in disguise, okay, or kind of incognito, um, or at least an anonymous figure, okay, so that they can blend into the background and observe other people in the city. So they are generally wealthy gentlemen, uh, which makes sense because obviously the kind of working classes or the poorer classes of the 19th century wouldn't have had the time or the luxury to be able to obviously kind of um, take on this uh, quite decadent um, activity, which wasn't obviously massively uh, productive. Um, so yeah, it was generally an activity of kind of wealthy gentlemen. So they are often seen as kind of not belonging kind of to a particular space, okay? They exist in this kind of liminal space. Um, so they don't, they're not part of the groups that they observe. And this leads to them kind of being viewed as these quite isolated or introspective figures, okay, and um, who are kind of outside of society. Um, obviously, this is just a general framework to give you an idea of what the Flaneur is and their role in society. But obviously, these definitions are a little bit more flexible. Um, and what we'll do is we'll look at this in relation to Jekyll and Hyde. And I'll also be interchanging the term Flaneur with Urban Explorer. And what I'm generally meaning there is just someone who meets a lot of this criteria, okay, someone who is generally observing the city and kind of is trying to explore through the city and remain kind of anonymous and on the fringes of society. Um, and I'll come on to explain this a little bit more as we go through. So I have this quotation um, here on the slide from Charles Baudelaire, um, who describes Flannery, so as the act of being a flaneur and kind of going out and walking. Um, as to be away from home and yet to feel oneself everywhere at home, to see the world, to be at the centre of the world, and yet to remain hidden from the world. Impartial natures which the tongue can but clumsily define. The spectator is a prince who everywhere rejoices in his incognito. So I want you to consider this and I want you to think, why would someone want to be a flaneur? What are the benefits of it? Okay, so what is the advantages of being this kind of um, anonymous observer of city life? So if you want to pause the recording, take a minute to think about this and then press play when you're ready to continue. OK, so why be a flaneur? Um, so this is obviously not an exhaustive list. There are things that you might have thought of that I haven't listed here, and that's absolutely fine. Um, but just to kind of show you what some of the things that I've kind of considered. Um, so the first one is the idea of um, walking and observing for leisure. So this is the more typical romantic image of the flaneur that Baudelaire initially um, kind of conjured up in his original interpretation or his original kind of rendering of the Flaneur, okay? And um, so this is someone who Hayward describes as having a childlike fascination with the city. Um, so, as I say, this is kind of more romantic image of the Flaneur who is captivated and in awe by the people that they observe, okay? Um, we also need to consider that there, there is a slightly problematic 
way of viewing this because there is a kind of voyeurism there where a lot of the people that they observe um, or haven't actually consented to be watched, okay, as these people kind of walk around and make uh, judgments about them. Okay, so the next category, I'm not really going to focus on as much, um, and I haven't written down the slide there, um, purely because it doesn't feature as heavily in um, Jekyll and Hyde, but it is important that you know about, and that is the social investigator. So social investigators were people like Henry Mayhew, who wrote London Labour and the London Poor. And these journalists, these middle class journalists, would go into um, often poorer areas and they would interview um, like these kind of working or poorer classes. So they'll interview costmongers and mudlarks and um, general kind of traders in the city. And they'd interview them and find out what their life is like. And this would be really intriguing, really interesting for middle class readers at home who wouldn't usually have much of an idea of um, what that kind of life was like. OK, um, so this was kind of referred to as social investigation. Uh, the other version of that is when the journalist is a little bit more unscrupulous about their methods. They will pretend to be part of that group um, to try and assimilate within them. They'll pretend to be these traders themselves. They'll pretend to be working class. Um, and that is in, in these kind of poorer areas, and that is known as slumming. So we could say Hyde kind of does that in a way, in the way that he lives in Soho amongst um, this kind of poorer, more degenerated area. Um, but it's not for the reasons of journalism, okay? It is um, for different reasons. So as I say, kind of there's, there's hints of kind of that social journalism kind of within there with this exploration, but it's not as prominent as some of the other types of journalists that we see. So the next category, which is a, which is similar, which I would say is far more obvious uh, in the text, is that of the detective. Um, so this can be either um, an actual detective or an amateur detective. So this can either be through an actual detective adopting the observation skills of a flaneur, um, or on the flip side of it, it could be a flaneur um, acting upon their observations and following clues and trying to solve crimes within the city um, just out of their own sort of curiosity. So the anonymous status of the flaneur allows the detective to be this kind of skillful sleuth and go about collecting clues kind of unimpeded. So on the reverse side of this, um, we have the criminal. OK, so it can either be one of two things, really. Um, so not content with just observing, the criminal becomes even more involved and fixated on the people that they watch. So they're no longer detached outsiders. Um, this is both the criminal and the detective um, as well. Um, since they involve themselves in city life, but they do maintain that emotional detachment, which allows them to commit crimes. The anonymity of the city protects them, which we talked about briefly in the first part when we were looking at Hyde. Um, also, the Flanua has this kind of in-depth knowledge of the city, uh, which is very um, helpful to the criminal, okay? So it helps them kind of escape detection. It also kind of lets them know about people's routines. Um, and this is kind of when we'll come on to talk later about the criminal flaneur a little bit more about how this is kind of um, in keeping with our impressions of, um, of kind of other criminals kind of in the city, even in the kind of modern city. Okay, so let's start with the first category, which is walking for leisure. So this is right at the start of the text where Sean Utterson and Enfield going on their weekly Sunday walk. So this sets up a really key important theme, even though it might seem um, quite trivial at the time that they're actually walking, but it is really, really important. And so this is quite a lengthy quote, but I am just going to read this out. Um, so it shows the importance here of kind of social relationships. So um, I'll just get to see, so I'll read this out. So it was reported by those who encountered them in their Sunday walks that they said nothing, looked singularly dull and would hail with obvious relief the appearance of a friend. For all that, the two men put the greatest store, of the, store by these excursions, counted them the chief jewel of each week, and not only set aside occasions of pleasure, but even resisted the calls of business that they might enjoy them uninterrupted. It chanced on one of these rambles that their way led them down a by street in a busy quarter of London. The street was small and what is called quiet, but it drove a thriving trade on the weekdays. Even on Sunday, when it veiled its more florid charms and lay comparatively empty of passage, the street shone out of contrast um, to its dingy neighbourhood, like a forest, like a fire in a forest. And with its freshly painted shutters, well-polished brasses and general cleanliness and gaiety of note, instantly caught and pleased the eye of the passenger. 
Okay, so I want you to consider um, this question that I've just got on the slide here. So how can we consider this flannery as opposed to just walking? So what makes this distinct? How are how can we consider Enfield and Upperson flaneurs? Okay, so again, if you just want to pause the recording and press play when you're ready to continue. Okay, so the purpose of these strolls we gather from this passage is not walking kind of for recreation or exercise. It is this type of urban exploration. They go into these spaces that they wouldn't normally. Um, they kind of, as I say, they, they chanced upon one of these rambles to go down this busy by street. And all the things that the reader is drawn to are other people. Okay, we're not focusing on Ups and Nenfield in this, uh, in this passage that I've read here. We're looking at the other people. So the reader themselves actually becomes a bit of a vicarious urban explorer through Ups and Nenfield. And so, as I say, they're, they're kind of more focused on the activities of the other people in the city um, rather than each other. As it's noted here, that they kind of don't seem to kind of speak to each other. Um, they look actually not like they're particularly enjoying each other's company. But yeah, it is this, this idea of going on a stroll and having a look around the city. OK. So the next one is, as I mentioned, I was talking about the detective and the criminal. So looking at the flaneur and crime, what I'm going to do is I'll read through um, how these two, the detective and the criminal, link, and then we'll go through each of them in relation to the text. So, uh, Walter Benjamin, who I mentioned at the very beginning of the workshop, um, discusses how the flaneur can be linked to criminal activities. So Benjamin said that, no matter what trail the flaneur may follow, every one of them will lead to a crime. So I want you to pause now and I want you to consider what Benjamin means by this and whether or not you agree. Also, I want you to think about instances where we might be able to say this in Stevenson's text. Okay, so considering those questions in the back of your mind as we go through, um, I will talk you through some interpretations and you can see how that compares to the, some of the ideas that you came up with. Um, so one critic notes, notes of um, Benjamin's statement that it provides us with a portrait of the flaneur, the solitary urban stroller as detective, tracking down the transgressions committed in the metropolis and imposing a species of social control over that lawless formation known as the crowd. Yet it also allows for another precisely opposite reading. For here, we, can, we also can see the flaneur as himself criminal, his wanderings through the city streets as themselves perhaps criminal acts, inevitably leading the crime. Okay, so we can see a contradiction here in what we kind of consider um, constitutes being a flaneur. So they're meant to be, as I mentioned at the beginning, detached and um, kind of purposeless, they're sort of aimless wanderers. Um, but obviously, detective work and criminality do have a kind of aim to them, okay? They're not um, just kind of these casual strolls and these um, kind of harmless observations, okay? They're really quite active. Um, but what we can see is detectives and criminals may begin, um, at least we can see this in the text, as harmlessly observing the environment and the people in the city. Um, but through these observations, they become heavily involved um, in the people lives that they observe, okay? Um, so this is often to an obsessive point. So their role as a flaneur, their skills of being hidden away in the city and their ability to carefully observe others can help them in their detective work or if in the case of the criminal, protect them from the law. So I've asked you to consider where this occurs in the text. And we do have a few instances of this where the flaneur gets too involved and stops being impartial to those who he observes. So the first example of this is Utterson. So I want you to consider Utterson as an amateur detective. So we have this movement initially from him walking with Enfield um, and just taking in the sights of the city to him becoming a lot more involved, okay? Um, okay, so what I want you to consider is what, mo what motivates Utterson to take on the role as a detective? And obviously we're talking about his pursuit of Hyde as soon as he finds um, out this information. How successful is Utterson in this role? And does he have any blind spots and how can these be accounted for? Okay, so Utterson is motivated primarily for his concern for his friend Henry Jekyll. Okay, so Jekyll is a respectable man and his friendship with Hyde both worries and confuses Utterson. So this curiosity um, renders Utterson no longer impartial as he doggedly seeks to uncover the mystery behind Mr. Hyde. And his success is hampered actually, I would argue, by this affinity to Jekyll. Um, so while he does eventually uncover the secret um, of Jekyll and Hyde, it's only when it's a little bit too late to have any real impact. Um, while he is successful in seeking out Hyde and finding him, his inability to sit back and observe possibly hampers his investigation. 
Um, again, we see his lack of involvement, his movement away from being just a fanua as something which has impacted him. Um, he obviously confronts them actually quite early on, uh, rather than continuing to sort of scope him out. He's a little bit too impatient, really. And his blind spots actually revolve around his close relationship with Jekyll and his inability to say that the two men are actually one. OK. I just want to read here this part, this um, passage, sorry, um, where Utterson is waiting for Hyde. OK, so he says that if he be Mr. Hyde, he had thought, I shall be Mr. Seek. Small sounds carried far, domestic sounds out of the houses were clearly audible on either side of the roadway. And the rumour of the approach of any passenger preceded him by a long time. Mr. Utterson had been some minutes at his post when he was aware of an odd light footstep drawing near. In the course of his nightly patrols, he had long grown accustomed to the quaint effect with which the footfalls of a single person, which he is, which he is still a great way off, suddenly spring out distinct from the vast hum and clatter of the city. Yet his attention had never before been so sharply and decisively arrested, and it was with a strong superstitious, superstitious um, provision of success that he withdrew into the entry of the court. So we can see here how Utterson's knowledge of the city have made him a better detective and has made him more observant. So we can even distinguish between the types of footsteps. Um, he's patient, he's able to blend into the urban landscape without attracting too much attention, and he knows the passageways that will eventually lead him to hide. Uh, later, he becomes a little bit more out of his depth as he kind of goes more sort of in, as he goes into Soho and he describes it as a city in nightmare. Um, perhaps highlighting actually the vulnerability of the Flanua um, in these areas. So we can see here he's got kind of these, he's got this kind of paradoxical status, I suppose, okay, where he's he's familiar um, to an extent with some of the routes, but then he just become massively overwhelmed by the kind of chaos of the city. Okay. So what I want you to consider as we go through the next few slides then is Hyde himself. So to what extent is Hyde a Flanua? And what we'll do is we'll be kind of answering this as we go through the next few slides. So I just want you to invite you to pause a moment and just think of any kind of um, points that you might have about this or any key scenes uh, that might help as you kind of as we go through these next few slides. So um, moving on to the idea is him, first of all, as kind of a criminal flaneur, um, which I mentioned at the beginning. So Jekyll creates Hyde as a way to compartmentalise the sensation and thrill seeking side of himself enabling him to maintain his status as a respectable citizen. Um, so I want to consider Hyde as what you would call kind of a man about town. Okay, um, so a man about town is um, someone who would go to a, a wealthy, sociable gentleman who would go to quite fashionable places, often in quite impoverished areas um, for this kind of sensation and thrill-seeking uh, pleasures of them. Okay, so I'm just going to read out this um, part here. So it um, says that, when I, when I would come back from these excursions, I was often plunged into a kind of wonder at my vicarious depravity, the familiar that I called out of my own soul and sent forth alone to do his good pleasure was a being inherently malign and villainous, his every act and thought centered on self, drinking pleasure with bestial avidity from any degree of torture to another, relentless like a man of stone. Henry Jekyll stood at times aghast before the acts of Edward Hyde, but the situation was apart from ordinary laws, and insidiously relaxed in a grasp of consciousness tempted me until I fell into slavery. So he deals with the guilt caused by these kind of dark desires by placing the blame solely onto his alter ego. Um, so there's perhaps a criticism about these men about town who would go into these poorer areas to kind of indulge in these more sort of deviant or transgressive acts as a way to avoid scandal. Okay, so it's the idea that actually the criminal wasn't necessarily the sort of working class criminal, but there was also an upper class criminal, um, but they were kind of protected by the sort of status. So it's about kind of criticising the secrecy and this idea that these gentlemen were kind of consumed to excess and sort of exploit these kind of areas um, and be able to kind of retreat back to their kind of normal um, or quite privileged lives, really. Okay, so that is kind of one sense that he's a flaneur, okay? So he's a flaneur in the way that he's kind of goes out to kind of eventually sort of commit these criminal acts, but he is also um, a kind of way for um, Jekyll to kind of vicariously experience uh, these, the, this kind of side of Soho. So as I say, this is kind of what we're to vicarious flannery. Um, so he doesn't want to have any of the responsibility, um, that is Jekyll. Um, 
He wants to be able to vicariously enjoy the secret life without any consequences. So as Jekyll and Hyde share memories, Jekyll becomes a type of Fenua himself, detached and not entirely present, impartial and isolated from the city. As we know, however, it does not remain this way. And like Utterson, Hyde becomes too involved. Looking at kind of this idea of the criminal um, or aggressive Fenua, um, this occurs when the, um, quote, consequential and inconsequential observing and interacting with the city spans over space and time, irretrievably imprinting the Fenua with an aggressive impulse. So being part of the city and yet isolated and detached from it creates an kind of sense of aggression. Um, so we also have this idea of the, the, the aggressive Flanua allows for, quote, the simultaneous coexistence of the Victorian gentleman, scrutinous of the vibrant streets of London and the obsessed killer whose actions foreshadow the looming 20th century. So what we have here, it's quite easy to see how this transition could occur. If we remember the characteristics of the Flaneur from the start of the workshop, we have these isolated individuals um, who are intensely observing the actions of others and having this power and authority over the city. They have this power through the people that they observe um, with this kind of knowledge about them. So it's quite easy to see here the connections that we have between um, characters like Hyde and the serial killer, um, which has been referred to here. Remember as well, this has been written at the time of Jack the Ripper. So we have um, this quote here where he says, all at once I saw two figures, one a little man who was, stump who was stumping across along eastward at a good walk, and another of a girl of maybe eight or ten who was running as hard as she was able down a cross street. Well, sir, the two ran into one another, naturally enough at the corner, and then came to a horrible part of the thing. Sorry, and then came the horrible part of the thing. For the man trampled calmly over the child's body and left her screaming on the ground. So what I want you to do is just take a moment and consider how we can link this to the idea of the flanua, or the aggressive flanua more specifically. So the flanua is a detached observer moving around the city as if invisible, and the actions are meant to be kind of inconsequential, they're not meant to really be impacting the city that they observe. Hyde is this kind of macabre version of the flanua, um, so he tramples the young girl in a way um, that she's kind of almost part of the city. So he kind of blunders past her, ignores, it, ignores her cries. So he is a friend who has an impact on his environment and the world around him. Um, it's him who's actually oblivious. So rather than being this kind of anonymous, silent observer, he behaves as if other citizens weren't um, present. The way that he actually tramples over her implies that she's sort of kind of just part of the city. Um, that, you know, she's not any more distinct from a piece of pavement for him. So we also have um, here a quote from um, Catherine M. Welter, who says that Hyde's ability to walk with the relentless force of a juggernaut grants him a power that no one else shares, a power which, when coupled with his chaotic nature, makes him extremely dangerous. So his dangerousness is rooted in his ability to break social norms, to disrupt the peaceful or bourgeois notions of, the, of Flannery. He is the Flaneur at the most extreme and the most intrusive. He's no longer content to simply observe. He's kind of dominating the city and feeling superior to the rest of its inhabitants. So again, we have this kind of very much this extreme sort of form of um, Flannery and ob observation uh, where the Flaneur actually kind of takes control of the city. Okay. So I'm just going to um, finish um, shortly by discussing how Hyde is a Flanua in relation to his visibility. So we've seen from the previous scene we've just described that he does not attempt in many ways to make himself anonymous um, or try to blend into the crowd. Um, so Anna Lapine argues that Hyde is um, an implicit member of this community, known not only to Jekyll, but also to the witnessing maid, to her master, to Poole, and in name to Utterson. Paradoxically, while Jekyll hopes that each of his cells could be could but be housed in separate identities, going so far as to set up an apartment in Soho, a separate bank account, and practically a different handwriting, his self-contained and vigilant community ensures that Hyde soon becomes known to everyone. Hypervisible and strange to look upon, Hyde is an evil hidden in plain sight, invisible to the community's members exactly because he is known to them. Watching its borders to keep evil out, the community does not observe the evil within its myths, or when it does, it protects the offender. Um, so I find this really quite interesting, really. So this is kind of the core terror of Hyde. He doesn't attempt to make himself invisible because he's protected by actually quite allegedly respectable citizens. 
Um, so he's perhaps too visible to be what Baudelaire considers a flaneur, but he may be indicative of a new type of urban explorer or expose the threat of urban exploration that wealthy gentlemen are able to dominate and control the city as if they were acting anonymously. Okay, so here are just some of the references that I've talked about in the slide here, if you wanted to have a look at them, and just some of the images that are being used. Thank you for participating in this workshop. If you are interested in learning more about what it's like to study English literature and creative writing at university, you can start with our website, or feel free to email with any questions. Thank you.